Now, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I want to start with some apologies which I believe are most appropriate to this audience. Um, for the record, here and up front, I want to apologize for having spent several years ripping up GM crops. I'm also sorry that I helped start the anti-GM movement back in the 90s and that I thereby assisted in demonizing an important technological option which can and should be used to benefit the environment. As an environmentalist and someone who believes that everyone in this world has a right to a healthy and nutritious diet of their choosing, I could not have chosen a more counterproductive path, and I now regret it completely. So I guess you'll be wondering, following on from what Mike said, what happened between 1995 and now that made me not only change my mind, but actually come here and stand before you today and admit it? Well, the answer is fairly simple. I discovered science, and in the process, I hope, I'm becoming a better environmentalist. Now, to take you back to 1995, when I first heard about Monsanto's uh, GM soya, I knew exactly and immediately what I thought. Here was a big American corporation with a nasty track record, putting something new and experimental into our food supply without telling us. Mixing genes between species seemed to be about as unnatural as you can get. Here was humankind acquiring too much technological power. Something was bound to go horribly wrong. These genes would spread like some kind of living pollution. It was the stuff of nightmares. Now, these fears spread like wildfire, and within a few years, GM was essentially banned in Europe, and our worries were exported by NGOs like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth to Africa, India, and the rest of Asia, where GM is still banned today. This was the most successful campaign that I've ever been involved with, a lot more successful than the campaign against global warming. This was also an explicitly anti-science movement. We employed a lot of imagery about scientists in their labs cackling demonically as they tinkered with the very building blocks of life. Hence the Frankenstein food tag, which was eagerly taken up by the Daily Mail, of course. This absolutely was about deep-seated fears of scientific powers being used for unnatural and demonic ends. What we didn't realize at the time was that the real Frankenstein's monster was not the GM technology, but our reaction against it. For me, this anti-science environmentalism became increasingly inconsistent with my pro-science environmentalism with regards to climate change. Um, I published my first book on global warming in 2004, um, and I was determined to make it scientifically credible rather than just a collection of anecdotes. It was basically a, a travelogue going around the world looking at the impacts of climate change. So, for example, I had to back up my sto the story of my trip to Alaska with satellite data on um, sea ice, and I had to justify my pictures of disappearing glasses in the Peruvian Andes with long-term records of the mass, bounce, mass balances of mountain glaciers around the world. And that meant I had to learn how to read scientific papers, understand basic science, statistics, and become a bit more literate in diff very different fields from oceanography to paleoclimate, none of which my degree in politics and modern history helped me with an enormous amount. Um, I found myself arguing constantly with people who I considered to be incorrigibly anti-science because they wouldn't listen to the climatologists and they denied the scientific reality of climate change. And so I lectured them about the value of peer review, about the importance of scientific consensus and how the only facts that mattered were the ones published in the most distinguished scholarly journals. Now my second book, Six Degrees, was so sciencey that it even won the Royal Society Science Books Prize and climate scientists I've become friendly with would joke that I knew more about the subject than they did. And yet, incredibly, at this time in 2008, I was still penning screeds in The Guardian attacking the science of GM, even though I'd done no academic research on the topic and had a very limited personal understanding. I don't think I'd ever read a peer-reviewed paper on biotechnology or any aspect of plant science, even at this late stage, and I'm ashamed to admit it. Now, obviously, this contradiction was untenable in the long term. What really threw me, actually, were some of the comments underneath my final anti-GM um, piece in The Guardian. Uh, one particular crit critic said to me in the comments, so you're opposed to GM on the basis it's marketed by big corporations. Are you also opposed to the wheel because it's marketed by the big auto companies? And I thought, well, that's an interesting analogy. So I, <laughs> so I did some reading. And I discovered that one by one, my cherished beliefs about GM turned out to be little more than green urban myths. I'd assumed that it would increase the use of chemicals. It turned out that pest-resistant cotton and maize needed less insecticide. I'd assumed that GM benefited only the big companies. It turned out that billions of dollars of benefits were accruing to farmers 
around the world, especially in developing countries who needed fewer inputs. I'd assume that Terminator technology was robbing farmers of the right to save seed. Turned out that hybrids did that long ago and that Terminator never actually happened. I'd assume that no one wanted GM. Actually, what happened was that BT cotton was pirated into India and Roundup Ready soy was pirated into Brazil because farmers were so eager to use them. I'd assume that GM was dangerous. It turned out it was safer and more precise than conventional breeding using mutagenesis, for example. GM just moves a couple of genes, whereas conventional breeding mucks about with the entire genome in a trial and error way. But what about mixing genes between unrelated species, the, the fish and the tomato, for instance? It turns out viruses do that all the time, as do plants and insects and even us. It's called gene flow. But this was still only the beginning, so in my third book, The God Species, I junked all the environmentalist orthodoxy at the outset and tried to look at the bigger picture on a planetary scale. And this is the challenge that faces us today, as I saw it. We're going to have to feed 9.5 billion, hopefully much less poor people, by 2050 on about the same land areas we use today, using limited fertilizer, water, pesticides, and in the context of a rapidly changing climate. So um, let's unpack this a bit. I know in a previous year's lecture at this conference there was the topic of population growth. Um, this area, too, is, is beset by a number of myths. People think that high rates of fertility in the developing world are the big issue. In other words, that poorer people are essentially having too many children, and therefore we either need family planning or something even more drastic like mass one-child policies. The reality is that global average fertility is down to 2.5. And if you consider that natural replacement is 2.2, this figure is not very much above that. So where is the massive population growth coming from? It's coming because of declining infant mortality. More of today's youngsters are growing up to have their own children rather than dying of preventable diseases in early childhood. The rapid decline in infant mortality is one of the best news stories of our decade, and the heartland, heartland of this great success story is in sub-Saharan Africa. It's not that there are legions more children being born. In fact, in the words of Hans Rosling, we are already at peak child. That is, there's about 2 billion children alive today, and there will never be more in absolute terms because of this de declining uh, average fertility rate. But so many more of these 2 billion children will survive into adulthood today to have their own children. These are the parents of the young adults of 2050. That's the source of this 9.5 billion UN population um, projection for 2050. And you don't have to have lost a child, God forbid, or even be a parent to know that declining infant mortality is a, a, a absolutely a good thing. So how much food will all these people need? According to the latest projections published last year in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, we're looking at a global demand increase of well over 100% by mid-century, by 2050. This is almost entirely down to GDP growth, um, especially in developing countries. In other words, we need to produce more food, not just to keep up with population, but because poverty is gradually being eradicated, along with the widespread malnutrition that still means that close to 800 million people go to bed hungry each night. And I would challenge anyone in a rich country to say that this GDP growth in poor countries is a bad thing. But as a result of this growth, we have very serious environmental challenges to tackle. <coughs> Land conversion is the large source of greenhouse gases and perhaps the greatest source of biodiversity loss. This is another reason why intensification and sustainable intensification being today's buzzword, buzz phrase, is essential. We have to grow more on limited land in order to save the rainforest and the remaining natural habitats from going under the plow. We also have to deal with limited water not just depleting aquifers, which are a serious problem in some parts of the world, but also the droughts, which are expected to strike with increasing intensity and frequency in the agricultural heartlands of the great continents, thanks to climate change. If we take more water from the rivers, of course, we accelerate biodiversity loss in these fragile habitats. We also need to better manage nitrogen use. Artificial fertilizer is essential to feed humanity and let no one deny it. But its inefficient use means that we see dead zones spreading around the world, 20,000 acres of the Gulf of Mexico, 20,000 square kilometers, rather, of the Gulf of Mexico every year is now a dead zone. And the same process is happening in many coastal areas around the world and habitats, um, uh, freshwater habitats, which are subject to eutrophication. Now, it's not enough to sit back and hope that technological innovation will solve all of our problems. We have to be much more activist and much more strategic than that. We have to ensure that technological innovation moves much more rapidly 
and in the right direction for those who most need it. In a sense, we've been here before. When Paul Ehrlich published the population bomb in 1968, he wrote, and I quote, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. That's a very famous quote. You probably, all, many of you have heard it before. And his advice and the advice of many other Malthusians at the time was explicit. In basket case countries like India, people might as well starve sooner rather than later, and therefore food aid to them should be eliminated to reduce future population growth. Now, by the way, it was not preordained that Ehrlich would be wrong. In fact, if everyone had heeded his advice, then perhaps hundreds of millions of people might well have died needlessly. But in the event malnutrition was cut dramatically and India became food self-sufficient, thanks to Norman Borlaug and his Green Revolution. Now, it's important to recall that Borlaug was equally as worried about population growth as Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich. He just thought it was worth trying to do something about it. He was a pragmatist because he believed in doing what was possible, but he was also an idealist because he believed that people everywhere deserved and had the right to have enough to eat. So what did Norman Borlaug do? He turned to science and technology. Humans are a tool-making species. From clothes to plows, technology is primarily what distinguishes us from other apes. And much of this work uh, that Borlaug did and with, with his companions was focused on the genome of major domesticated crops. If wheat, for example, could be shorter and put more effort into seed making rather than stalks, then yields would improve and grain loss due to lodging would be minimized. Before Borlaug died in 2009, he spent many years campaigning against those like myself who for political and ideological reasons oppose modern innovation in agriculture. To quote again, he said, if the naysayers do manage to stop agricultural biotechnology, they might actually precipitate the famines and the crisis of biodiversity they've been predicting for nearly 40 years. And you can guess who that was aimed at. And thanks to supposedly environmental campaigns now spread from Afri affluent countries, we're perilously close to this position. Biotechnology has not been stopped, but it has been made prohibitively, prohibitively expensive to all but the very biggest corporations. It now costs tens of millions to get a crop through the regulatory systems in different countries. In fact, um, the latest figures I, I picked up just two days ago from CropLife suggest it costs $139 million to move from discovering a new crop trait to full commercialization. So obviously the open source and the public sector biotech approaches really don't stand a chance. And there's a depressing irony here that the anti-biotech campaigners complain about GM crops only being marketed by big corporations when this is a situation they've done more than anyone else to help bring about. In the EU, the system is at a virtual standstill, and many GM crops have been waiting a decade or more for approval, but are permanently held up by the twisted domestic politics of anti-biotech countries like Austria, Germany, and France. Around the whole world, the regulatory delay has increased to more than five and a half years now, from 3.7 years back in 2002. The bureaucratic burden is clearly getting worse all the time. France, remember, long refused to accept the potato because it was an American import. As one commentator put it recently, Europe is on the verge of becoming a food museum, and you will all be, or many of you will be, curators of this museum. We well-fed consumers are blinded by romantic nostalgia for the traditional farming methods of the past. Because we have enough to eat, we can afford to indulge our aesthetic illusions. But at the same time, the growth of yields worldwide has stagnated for many of the major food crops, as research published only last month by John Foley and others in the journal Nature Communications showed. If we don't get yield growth back on track, we're indeed going to have trouble keeping up with population growth and the resulting increases in demand, and prices will rise, as well as more land will be converted from nature to agriculture. To quote Norman Borlaug again, he said, I now say that the world has the technology, either available or well advanced in the research pipeline, to feed on a sustainable basis a population of 10 billion people. The more pertinent question today is whether farmers and ranchers will be permitted to use this new technology. While the affluent nations can certainly afford to adopt ultra-low risk positions and pay for, more, pay for food produced by the so-called organic methods, 
The one billion chronically undernourished people of the low-income food deficit nations cannot. End of quote. As Borlaug was saying, perhaps the most pernicious myth of all is that organic production is better, either for people or the environment. The idea that it's healthier has been repeatedly disproved in the scientific literature. We also know from many studies that organic is significantly less productive, uh, with up to 40 to 50% lower yields in terms of land area. The Soil Association went to great lengths in a recent report on feeding the world with organic, not to mention this productivity gap anywhere. Nor did it mention that overall, if you take into account land displacement effects because of this productivity gap, Organic is also likely worse for biodiversity. Instead, they talk about an ideal world where people in the West eat less meat and fewer calories overall so that people in developing countries can have more. This is simplistic nonsense. If you think about it, the organic movement is at its heart a rejectionist one. It doesn't accept many modern technologies on principle, like the Amish in Pennsylvania who froze their technology in 1850 with the horse and cart, the organic movement basically freezes its technology somewhere around 1950 and for no better reason. And it doesn't even apply this idea consistently. I was reading in a recent Soil Association magazine that it's okay to blast weeds with flamethrowers or fry them with electric currents, but benign herbicides like glyphosate are still a no-no because they are artificial chemicals. Now, in reality, there's no reason at all why avoiding artificial chemicals should be better for the environment. Quite the opposite, in fact. Recent research by Jesse Osabel and colleagues at Rockefeller University in the United States looked at how much extra farmland Indian farmers would have had to cultivate today using the technologies of 1961 to get today's overall yield. The answer is 65 million hectares, which is an area the size of France. In China, Maize farmers spared 120 million hectares, uh, an area twice the size of France, thanks to modern technologies getting higher yields. On a global scale, between 1961 and, and 2010, the area farmed grew by only 12%, whereas kilocalories per person rose from 2,200 to 2,800. So even with 3 billion more people in that time period, everyone still had more to eat, thanks to a production increase of 300% over that same period. And remember, the area farmed grew by only 12%. So how much land worldwide was spared in the process thanks to these dramatic yield improvements for which chemical inputs and modern farming played a crucial role? The answer is 3 billion hectares, or the equivalent of the land area of two South Americas. There would be no Amazon rainforest left today without this improvement in yield. Nor would there be any tigers in India or orangutans left in Indonesia. This is why I don't understand why so many of those opposing the use of technology in agriculture call themselves environmentalists. So where does this opposition come from? There seems to be a widespread assumption that modern technology equals more risk in a kind of a priori sense. Actually, there are many very natural and organic ways to face illness and early death as the debacle with Germany's organic bean sprouts showed perhaps in 2011. This, by the way, was a public health catastrophe with the same number of deaths and injuries as were caused by Chernobyl because E. coli, probably from animal manure-infected organic bean sprout seeds, were imported from Egypt, actually inside the seed. In total, 53 people died and 3,500 suffered serious kidney failure. And why were these consumers choosing organic? Because they thought it was safer and healthier and they were scared of entirely trivial risks from highly regulated chemical pesticides and fertilizers. And if you, if you look at the situation without prejudice, much of the debate, both in terms of anti-biotech and anti-GM and organic, is simply based on the naturalistic fallacy, the belief that natural is good and that artificial, if you can define it, is bad. This is a fallacy because, as I said, there's plenty of entirely natural poisons and ways to die as the relatives of those who died from the E. coli poisoning outbreak would tell you. For organic, the naturalistic fallacy is elevated into the central guiding principle for an entire movement. This is irrational, and we owe it to the earth and to our children to do better. Now, um, before you come back at me in the questions, this is not to say that organic farming has absolutely nothing to offer. Uh, my parents are organic farmers. In fact, they approved this speech. Um, there are, but I, I do want to... 
put on the record that I, I believe there are many good techniques which organic farmers have developed and, and deployed, such as intercropping, com com plant, companion planting, uh, the, the principles of agroecology, such as recycling nutrients and promoting on-farm diversity are ones which should be taken more seriously and hope will be taken more seriously everywhere. But organic is in the way of progress when it refuses to allow innovation. And again, using GM as the most obvious example, many third-generation GM crops allow us not to use these environmentally damaging chemicals because the genome of the crop in question has been altered so that the plant can protect itself against pests. So the question is, why is that not organic? Organic is also in the way when it's used as an excuse to take away choice from others. One of the commonest arguments against GM now is that organic farmers will be somehow contaminated, note the use of that word, with GM pollen, and therefore nobody anywhere should be allowed to use it. So apparently the rights of a well-heeled minority, which ultimately come down to a consumer preference based on aesthetics, trump the rights of everyone else to use improved crops which would probably benefit the environment overall. Now, uh, again, just to make very clear, I'm all for a world of, of diversity, but if that means one farming system claiming a monopoly of virtue and aiming at excluding all others, then I'm not in favor of that. Why can't we have peaceful coexistence? This is particularly the case when it shackles us to old technologies which have probably higher inherent risks than the new. Now, the biggest risk of all is that we do not take advantage of all sorts of opportunities for innovation because of what is in reality little more than blind prejudice. And let me give you two regrettable examples, both involving Greenpeace. Last year, Greenpeace destroyed a GM crop, wheat crop, in fact, in Australia for all the traditional reasons which I'm very familiar with, having engaged in these activities myself. Um, this was a crop which was um, being carried out, uh, a research which was being carried out by the Commonwealth Scientific Research Institute. Um, so it's public sector, but no matter, they were against it because it was GM and unnatural. Now, what few people have since heard is that the other trials being undertaken in that same plot, which Greenpeace activists with their strimmers luckily did not manage to destroy, accidentally found a wheat yield increase of an extraordinary 30%. Just think, this knowledge might never have been produced at all if Greenpeace had succeeded in destroying this innovation before we, anyone heard about it. As the president of the NFU, Peter Kendall, who I believe is here today, recently suggested, this is analogous to burning books in a library before anyone had a chance to read them. The second example comes from China, where Greenpeace managed to trigger a national media panic by claiming that two dozen children had been used as human guinea pigs in a trial of GM golden rice. Uh, as the Secretary of State mentioned this morning, golden rice is in fact healthier and could save thousands of children from vitamin A deficiency related blindness and death each year. What happened in reality now is that three of th these three Chinese scientists named in the Greenpeace press release were publicly hounded and have since lost their jobs. And in, and in an autocratic country like China, they're at serious personal risk. Internationally, because of overregulation, sparked by NGO scare campaigns, golden rice has been on the shelf now for a decade, and thanks to the activities of groups like Greenpeace, it may never become available to vitamin deficient poorer people. This is, to my mind, immoral and inhumane, depriving the needy of something that would help them and their children because of the aesthetic preferences of rich people far away who are in no danger of vitamin A shortage. Greenpeace is a $100 million a year multinational, and as such, it has moral responsibilities just like any other large company. The fact that golden rice was developed in the public sector and for public benefit cuts no ice with the antis. Take Rothamsted Research, whose director, Morris Maloney, is speaking to you tomorrow. Last year, Rothamsted began a trial of aphid-resistant GM wheat, which would need no pesticides to combat this serious pest. Because it's GM, the antis were determined to destroy it. And they failed. They failed because of the courage of Professor John Pickett and his team who took to YouTube and took to the media to tell the important story of why their research mattered and why it should not be destroyed. They gathered thousands of signatures on a petition which the antis, when the antis could only manage to garner a couple of hundred, and the attempted destruction was a damp squib. One intruder did manage to scale the fence at a different point, however, who turned out to be the perfect stereotypical anti-GM protester, an old Etonian aristocrat whose colorful past makes our own local Marquis of Blandford look like the model of responsible citizenry. <laughs> this high-born activist scattered organic wheat seeds around the tr trial site in what was presumably a symbolic statement of naturalness, 
Professor Pickett's team told me they had a very low-tech solution to getting rid of it. They went around with a cord cordless portable hoover to, to clear it up off the field. Um, this year, as well as repeating the, the wheat trial, Rothamsted's working on an Omega-3, and I hope I'm not stealing Morris's thunder by saying this, but he's, they're working on an Omega-3 oil seed which could replace wild fish um, in, in food for farm salmon. So this could help reduce overfishing, of course, by allowing land-based feedstocks to be used in aquaculture. So yes, it's GM, and expect the antis to oppose this too, despite the obvious potential benefits in terms of marine biodiversity. So I don't know about you, but I've had enough. And so my conclusion today is very clear. The GM debate is over. It is finished. We no longer need to discuss whether or not it's safe. Over a decade and a half with three million, three trillion rather, GM meals eaten, there's never been a single substantiated case of harm. You're more likely to get hit by an asteroid than you are to get hurt by eating GM food. More to the point, people have died from choosing organic, as I mentioned earlier, but no one has died from eating GM. Just as I did 10 years ago, Greenpeace and the Soil Association and all the other NGOs like Friends of the Earth, um, who are quoted in The Guardian this morning, taking the same line they've taken for 15 years, claim to be guided by consensus science, as they are, as, as they claim on climate change. Yet on GM, there's a rock-solid scientific consensus backed by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the, the Royal Society, health institutes, medical institutes, national science academies around the world. And yet this inconvenient truth, to coin a phrase, is ignored because it conflicts with the ideology and the vested interests of these NGOs. One final example, which you've also heard about already this morning, is the sad story of the uh, GM blight-resistant potato. This is being developed by the Sainsbury Laboratory and Chagash, in, which is a publicly funded institute in, in Ireland. But the Irish Green Party, whose leader often attends this very conference, was so opposed that they even took out a court case to stop it. This is despite the fact that the blight-resistant potato would save farmers from doing 15 fungicide sprays per season, that pollen transfer is not really an issue with potatoes because they're clonally propagated, and that the offending gene, which they're against, came from the wild relative of a potato. It didn't even come from a fish or anything. Now, there would, I think, to my mind, have been a nice historical resonance to having a blight-resistant potato developed in Ireland, given the million or more who died in the potato famine in the mid-19th century. It would, in fact, have been a wonderful thing for Ireland to be the country that defeated the blight. But thanks to the Green Party, this seems not to be the case. And unfortunately, the antis now have the bureaucrats on their side, Wales and Scotland are officially GM-free, taking medieval superstition as a strategic imperative for the devolved government supposedly guided by science, and they lose no opportunity to remind you of this. It's unfortunately much the same in, in, in most of Africa and Asia. India recently rejected BT brinjal, uh, eggplant, even though it would reduce insecticide applications in the field and um, residues, therefore, on the fruit. The government in India is increasingly enthralled to backward-looking ideologues like Vandana Shiva, who idealized pre-industrial village agriculture despite the fact it was an age of repeated famines and structural insecurity for everyone. In Africa, no GM is still the motto for many governments. Kenya, for example, has actually banned GM foods because of the supposed health risks they pose, despite the fact that they could help reduce the malnutrition, which is still rampant in the country. And malnutrition, by the way, is a proven health risk with no further evidence needed. In Kenya, and I couldn't believe this when I first heard it, but in Kenya, if you develop a GM crop which has higher nutrition or higher yield or something used to benefit poorer people, you will go to jail for 10 years. Thus, desperately needed agricultural innovation is being strangled by a suffocating burden of regulations which are not based on any rational scientific assessment of risk. Indeed, the risk today is not that anyone will be harmed by GM food, but that millions will be harmed by not having enough to eat because of the vocal minority of people in rich countries who want, to be the, who want their meals to be what they consider to be natural. Now, I hope that things are beginning to change. The wonderful Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation recently gave a grant of $10 million, or pounds it may have been, to the John Innes Center to begin efforts to integrate nitrogen-fixing um, capabilities into the world's major food crops, starting with maize. Um, yes, Greenpeace, this will be GM. Time for you to get over it. If we're going to reduce the global scale problem of nitrogen pollution, then having major crop plants fixing their own nitrogen is surely a worthy goal. 
And GM is probably the only way to achieve this. Now, I know it's uh, politically incorrect to say this, but I think we need a major dose of both international myth-busting and international deregulation. The plant scientists I know hold their heads in their hands when I talk about this with them because governments and so many people have got their sense of risk so utterly back to front and are foreclosing a vitally necessary technology. Norman Borlaug is dead now. As I mentioned, he died in 2009. He was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. But I think we honor his memory and his vision when we refuse to give in to politically correct orthodoxies when we know they're wrong in points of fact. The stakes are high. If we continue to get this wrong, the life prospects of billions of people will be harmed. So I challenge all of you today to question your beliefs in this area and to see whether they stand up to rational examination. Always ask for evidence, as the campaigning group Sense About Science advises, and make sure you go beyond the self-referential reports of campaigning NGOs. But most important of all, farmers should be free to choose what kind of technologies they want to adopt. If you think the old ways are the best, if you want to cut your fields with a scythe, that's fine. You have that right. I'm not going to oppose it. What you don't have the right to do is to stand in the way of others who hope and strive for ways of doing things differently and hopefully doing them better. Farmers who understand the pressures of a growing population and the trials of a warming world, who understand that yields per hectare are the, probably the most important environmental metric, and who understand that technology never stops developing and that even the fridge and the humble, humble potato were new and scary once. So my message to the anti-GM lobby, from the ranks of the British arist aristocracy and celebrity chefs to the US foodies to the peasant groups of India, is this. You are entitled to your views, but you must know by now that they are not supported by science. We are coming to a crunch point, and for the sake of both people and the planet, now is the time for you to get out of the way and let the rest of, the, let the rest of us get on with feeding the world sustainably. Thank you very much. Mark, uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, your uh, presentation. Um, as I said at the beginning, the Frank Parkinson Lecture is supported to challenge our thinking, and I think uh, you'll all agree with me, uh, Mark has fully uh, met that brief. Now, I am sure there are a few questions. Uh, the form here is really quite simple. You try and attract the attention of one of the people who have the um, uh, uh, markers, and I will come to you. Can we stick to questions and not political statements. That's going to be an interesting one. And we'll try and fit in as much as we can in the next 25 minutes or so. So I'll go to microphone five first, please. Uh, John Neal from IGD. Firstly, can I apologise for delivering some anti-GM leaflets in the year, I think it was 2000 or 99 in East Yorkshire. Uh, it's 13 years ago now. I've learnt a lot since then. But um, the, my question is about development and um, population growth. Uh, two things that are challenges to sustainability and to feeding the world in the future. Um, I've heard before somebody put forward um, the premise that development is actually one of the answers to population growth because families then don't have to breed lots of children to support them in old age. So my question is, from a sustainability point of view, which is better? Thank you. Um, from a sustainability point of view, development is essential. Um, and it's development which has led us to the stage now where we are seeing the demographic, the demographic transition happen in so many countries. Um, even in countries like Bangladesh, where GDP is still relatively low, um, fertility is down to 2.6, 2.7. It's, it's very close to natural replacement around the whole of the world, which is why I think it's important to, to bust this myth that poorer people are having too many children, and it will always be the case um, that, that people choose to have larger families in poorer countries. Uh, in fact, as, as you see the processes both of, of GDP growth and of urbanization, um, and, and of all of the life choices that people have when they're in cities, when they are in um, a higher income country where they've got more opportunities for jobs, um, for getting out of, I mean, they don't necessarily all want to be subsistence farmers forever. Um, people want different, different job opportunities, different life opportunities, particularly if they're female. Um, and those, all of those processes add up to the declining global fertility rate. But as I said earlier on, the fact that 
so many younger children are surviving because we've got vastly improved health systems now in poorer countries. That means that the population growth is absolutely, there's nothing you can do about it. We're going to see a population of 9.5 billion, perhaps 10 billion by 2050, and all those people need to be fed, and they need to be fed on improved diets because they're hopefully going to be wealthier and less poor in, in the process. Uh, microphone three at the back there, please. Thank you. Uh, David Hills from uh, Duffield's Animal Feeds. Um, I, I think he's a very brave, brave man these days to put their head above the parapet and start talking about uh, GM, and I'm, I'm very pleased that today I hear those, those charges. We talk about today the challenge of feeding potentially 9 billion people. Um, how do we balance off the development of biofuels from feed that we are producing around the world with actually feed for human consumption? Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, to my mind, biofuels are generally an environmental and um, human rights disaster. Um, where they're taking feedstocks, which could be, go could be going either to feed animals or into the human food supply directly, and convert them into um, fuel for cars. And, uh, make that observation, particularly with regard to biodiesel made from palm oil in Indonesia, say, or to ethanol, which is taking up something like a third of the U.S. food and um, um, corn crop. Now, there's no doubt that that would raise prices overall because it's, it's reducing supply. Um, and that means that people in poorer countries are having to pay more for their food, and there is increasing malnutrition perhaps directly related to, to this increase in biofuels. Um, it also doesn't do anything to help climate change because of the land conversion and the, the displacement effects that you see which re release more greenhouse gases in tropical forests as they're cleared and so on and so forth. Um, so I think it's a very misguided policy. There may, be a, a, a route, there may be room for some biofuels, particularly if they're using waste products and so on, so I'm not ruling this out a priori, but I think biofuels using food crops are really, really not sustainable and not sensible either. A microphone two over here. Peter Fain again. Um, uh, whatever we think about the message, we've had 20 years of trying to get um, approval to commercial release of GM plants in particular through the European Union, advised by the best scientists available. Uh, their advice is not always taken, and we have very little to show for it. Should, how can we change that process, or should we be taking the opportunity uh, which was offered some years ago to do more of the approvals at a national or member state level? Well, I've, I've heard talk that there is a derogation, is that the right word, from the, um, from the EU bureaucracy, where these decisions could be taken more at a national level. I'm no expert on this, but my understanding is that seeds, new seeds have to be approved by the entire EU, and I guess that's because if you've got an, oops, if you've got an open market, then all of the products need to be able to be sold within um, all of the member countries without there being any sort of national barriers because something's GM or something's something else. So... To that extent, this does have to be rolled back at EU level. But I, I can't see any reason why France and, sorry, why, why Wales and Scotland have to have a GM free status. I mean, that's patently ridiculous. Um, I think if more ministers and, and secretaries of state go to, the, go to Brussels and, and make this case and have the courage, as you heard from the Secretary of State this morning, to make this case more openly without being worried about there being some kind of public backlash or, or backlash from the green NGOs, then we can begin to roll back the regulations because it simply isn't fair that crops which have been bred by some method which is probably safer have to be held up for 10 to 15 years by these unnecessary bureaucratic regulations which don't apply to an equivalent crop with an identical genome which has been developed from different methods. So it doesn't, it, it's totally, it's fundamentally irrational even at the most basic level and I think for that reason um, the, the rules will be changed and it's a process now we have to all, all, all help in, in getting that regulation rolled back. Down here at the front and then we'll go over to number six. And number four, who was, thank you. <coughs> Yes, um, good morning. Stuart Agnew, I'm a member of the European Parliament. I sit on the Agriculture Committee with Maraid and we have conversations, but we get on pretty well, I think. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your Damascus conversion. I was one of the farmers who grew GM crops 12, 11 years ago and was subjected to some of the sort of tyranny and intimidation that <laughs> forced many out of it. So it really is a very heartening to hear you say what you have. I went to Rothamsted in May to help defend the crop there, and I think everyone here would be interested to know that of the 150 people who are going to destroy that crop, I would have said that half were foreigners bust in, and when they started singing, they sang in French. <laughs> so that's the, that's the good news. Uh, on the other side of the coin, um, Al Gore produced a film about 10 years ago 
uh, called An Inconvenient Truth, in which he said that <coughs> carbon dioxide levels were rising, and he had the thing called a hockey stick graph, and everything was going to get hotter and hotter and hotter because of carbon dioxide levels. A third of my sugar beet was cr killed, frozen solid into the ground by global warming two years ago. I also experienced the coldest, wettest summer I've ever had, I think, since 1987. Carbon dioxide levels and methane levels were high. I don't think they can be the drivers of this because of what's actually happened. So what is driving it? Thank you. Perhaps we avoid the French mark and stick to the <laughs> weather. <shouldn't> we? <coughs> I think we can both be anti-French. We can agree on that even if we don't agree on climate change. Um, I, 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 I think if you, if, you, if you look at the fundamentals of this, um, there's no dispute, and I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't dispute that, that, that carbon dioxide and methane are greenhouse gases. Um, in, in an atmosphere without greenhouse gases um, and water vapor as well, of course, um, this planet would be, on average, I think, minus 18 degrees centigrade and frozen solid. So if, you, if all other things remaining equal, if you increase the proportion of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you'll get a warmer planet. And I think it's fairly clear from satellite measurements and everything else that the planet is in energy imbalance and is therefore gaining heat overall on average. That doesn't mean to say that you're not going to see uh, um, the, the usual fluctuations of weather, um, inclu including um, very cold winters on occasion. And in fact, there's some evidence that the jet stream is responding to the disappearing Arctic sea ice by being frozen in particular loop configurations and so on and so forth, which may in fact be responsible for some of the rather atrocious weather we've seen over the last summer and the last few winters as well. Um, I don't think that, um, that, that you can accept science in one area and not in another, and that was the whole point of, of, of what I was saying to you today. So for me, it was the fact that I accepted the, the consensus on climate science, and that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be dissent. I think dissent is essential in science, and, and I, I, I subscribe to a lot of the lists, and I listen to a lot of the, the dissenting opinions on climate change. So in no way does this exclude dissenting voices, but if you want to take the, the scientific consensus as your guide, then you should do so equally for, for, for climate science as you do for, for the science of biotechnology. That was more or less my message. Number six over here, David, please. Uh, David Beaver, Reading University. Um, as a scientist, as a scientist who worked on GMs and as a scientist who worked with Monsanto, not for Monsanto, I'm delighted uh, that science is actually coming through in the GM debate. I'm also delighted to hear that we're going to see more funding of, of science, and I look forward to that because there has been a considerable loss of the science base in the UK, the agricultural science loss. But Greenpeace and NGOs uh, such as them and, and, uh, and Friends of the Earth may no longer be your friends, but they're still there. They're still an amazing force. What can you do to go back and convince them that your conversion was right and they should follow your path? Um, good, good question. Again, um, I, I, I'd say this, probably this is no longer the case, but up until this morning, Greenpeace was my friend. Um, <laughs> And Friends of the Earth, too, and I, I work with them, and I have a lot of respect for a lot of the work they do. So this isn't to, to rule out all, all environmental NGOs, again, without uh, any kind of question. Um, but the, work, the good work that they do has to be balanced against the, the bad work that they've done over the last decade or two, which they need to... I'm, I'm trying to get them to retreat. I think they've got themselves into a corner, an unscientific corner on GM, on, on some very other specific areas as well. Um, but I think they're, they're, they're dead on, more or less, with, with climate change. Um, one of the other controversial things I've, I've done over the last few years is to have, take a pro-nuclear role in the energy debate. Um, and actually, one of, one of the things that really gave me a lot of hope recently was that the nuclear industry and the wind industry, so the low-carbon industries together, were beginning to join up. And Friends of the Earth and both Greenpeace were, were relatively supportive of that. So I think that there can be changes, perhaps subtle changes, at least at the, at the outset, in the positions that these NGOs take. And, and one shouldn't say that they are... Um, bad or out of order forever. But I think we have to encourage them by a process of constructive engagement to say, look, the world has moved on. You've got a bit left behind here, but you can play catch-up and you can actually change in some areas. You're not the Vatican. You're not the Pope. You, know, you don't have to say the same thing for 2,000 years. It's been 15 now. It's time for a change. <laughs> right, the next religious question, I suggest. Uh, Tom, number four, please. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Tom Heap, BBC. Um, Food uh, retailers, supermarkets, and manufacturers are extremely keen to sell their food through the natural image and the natural uh, things on packaging. Um, when could we see uh, food retailers and supermarkets 
making science a positive ingredient in their food and having the bravery to do that? And do they have a role in changing public opinion on the relative values of science versus nature in our food? Wow, another excellent um, um, question. Uh, I think there's, I mean, we could take as, a, as an example from the past to learn from the, the issue of food irradiation, um, which would have saved hundreds, probably thousands of lives by um, um, killing bacteria, which then people eat um, in their food. Because, and this was, in, again, entirely down to the naturalistic fallacy. People thought that their food would be radioactive in the supermarket aisles. Other things which should be very easy to, to, to myth bust, but weren't. And they, they catch on because people have... Uh, obviously, people have a very intense personal and emotional connection with their food, and, and, and a good thing too. Um, but that means, means that people are very susceptible to, to these kinds of, of myths being propagated from people with, with, with very strong ideological agendas. Um, and I don't think science, science and, and food are very uneasy bedfellows for that, for that very reason. Um, so I, I think, it, and also, of course, the first generation of GM crops had no benefit for the consumer, and they didn't have much benefit for the environment either. You know, I don't see Roundup Ready as being an enormously important um, environmental innovation, but that's not the case for some of the things which are coming through the pipeline now. Um, if you could have um, um, GM omega-3 oil seeds grown on, 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 in British farms, which are then used to make the food which are then... Um, sustainably farming salmon, then you don't have to go and hoover up all of the small fish in the sea. That's something which delivers the benefit, benefits to an environmentally conscious consumer. And I, I hope and I, I, I believe that, that the GM and science, if they are deployed with those ends in mind, would have a much more receptive audience than they do if they are deployed simply to, to help the profits, admittedly, of, of some very large corporations. That's, when, that, that's essentially the problem with the, the whole GM debate is it's got into this ideological thing of you're, if you're against big corporations, then the, being anti-GM is a kind of proxy war for that. Um, and I think we have to take it apart, which is why I'm so interested in supporting public sector initiatives on plant science. Mike, microphone five, please. Um, Emily Scott uh, from the University of Cambridge. Um, Mark, I was just wondering what your views are on the intellectual property issues and the, the sort of ownership issues that accompany the development of GM crops and what you think the role is of seed companies in ensuring that the GM seeds that they create can remain affordable and accessible in the countries where they would be most useful? Uh, another excellent question. Um, I, I think at a fundamental level, there's nothing wrong with intellectual property, and we should agree that, especially as I'm a, I'm a writer, and I don't want you pirating my books um, because I want to get the royalties for them, and so does anyone else who has intellectual property for something which they've creatively done, whether it's a technical in invention or, or, or something different. Um, and there is an incentive to, to develop new things if you have the IPR down the line where you're going to get some kind of financial reward from that. And perhaps you can consider that an investment. So if you take away intellectual property completely from the picture, then you are going to have a disincentive for innovation and for, for technological progress. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot being done in the public sector and which is supported by the public sector, which doesn't need to have um, very restrictive IPR attached to it. And Rothamsted made very clear with their GM wheat trial that that would be royalty free and would be offered to farmers for their own benefit on, on that basis. Um, and I think that's the same, the same would be the case for a lot of the um, nutritionally enhanced or dry, drought tolerant crops which are being developed in, in Africa, for example. Most of that's done in the public sector because these people don't have any money and so there's no great commercial advantage to anyone to do that. Um, and, it, and the seeds would have to be offered, um, again, not free of charge because nothing in this world is free of charge, but at a, at a reduced rate. Um, and I think there shouldn't be any restrictions on farmers saving seed if that's to their benefit. Although, of course, that hasn't been the case with, with hybrids. I mean, everyone grows hybrid maize and you don't save the seed because it won't breed true. And so I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about that too. But I think we should all support um, the, 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 the taxpayer-funded um, sectors here. But the problem is that these things can't be deployed. As I said, in Kenya, you'll do 10 years in jail if you take it out of the laboratory into the field. Uh, and the same is the case. I find it difficult to imagine Rothamsted's GM wheat being used in the fields in Britain um, over the next five years. I hope we can change that, but there's not much point in developing these things if you can never use them. Microphone one, down here, please. Uh, Martin Harper, the RSPB. Um, the NGOs have taken a bit of a kicking this morning for many speakers, so I thought someone ought to speak up. Anyway, um, one of the roles, I think, of NGOs is to put spotlights on inconvenient truths. So I think you have done that this morning. 
Also, for the record, you should say the RSPB did support the GM farm scale evaluation trial, so I've got a little bit of a halo this morning. Um, but much of the debate has thus far focused on the desire, perhaps understandably, to increase yields. But there are other inconvenient truths out there about the fact that there are a billion people who are currently obese and that every night a billion children go to bed hungry, uh, despite the fact that there is enough um, food currently being produced to feed the world. So I wonder if you want to comment on the issues of overconsumption and indeed access to food for people in the developing world. Um, yes, uh, uh, in particular the food security issue in the developing world. Um, if you look at the, the yield gap that you see between um, the major food crops as they're grown in sub-Saharan Africa and places like China, India, or the US, it's enormous. I mean, the, the, the yields that they're getting are a tenth of, what, of what, what they should be getting, even with fairly depleted soils that they have. Um, and if you could increase the productivity of, of those small-scale farmers, there would be an additional benefit in terms of food security and poverty reduction. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, you know, if you only doubled the, the yields of, uh, or the productivity of crops in sub-Saharan Africa, the continent would be food exporting. And, and in given that people are, are subs, you know, th these are people who are living subsistence lifestyles, they're eating their own food, productivity actually does matter for their food security probably more than anything else. And it's simplistic to say, well, these people in this continent are eating more and uh, eating too much, and these people in this continent are eating too little. I mean, it's not like you can truck um, all of these um, extra um, calories across the Atlantic and somehow make a real difference. The food is traded through the market, and there's a whole lot of other economic factors which are at play there too. So the, the, the only way, really, in the longer term where, where food security will be protected is through increasing GDP growth and accelerating the, the economic prospects of these countries. Luckily, that's a prospect which is already well underway, um, and in fact, rates of malnutrition have plummeted over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, largely in Asia, but also increasingly now in sub-Saharan Africa, thanks to these innovations. And again, I should make absolutely clear, GM is just one of a whole panoply of different um, options, and, uh, but it should be an option. It shouldn't be discounted on, on some kind of irrational basis, but it's not, uh, I'm not saying either that it's a silver bullet. Mark, talking of malnutrition, we have to move <laughs> into uh, lunch. Um, would you just all join me again, please, in thank you, thanking Mark for... Thank you.